put everybody on mute so i will have the sequence here hmm vedansh very sorry good. sir thank you let's start passenger ships main purpose of passenger ship is to transport passengers that is the main purpose now you have different types of passenger ships it is same thing like you know any other transportation some are going there just to enjoy vacation ye do ha ye traveling is not their issue for them it doesn't make any difference where ship is going they are looking like a nice seven star resort budget is not issue those are the luxury liners liners is a wrong word actually those are luxury passenger ships who go on planned passage you know like <clears throat> they will first announce we are going to go like this then they do the booking and everybody arranges their vacation time and join the ship and again the ship will go from port to port but yeah, they are also free some new batch joins in second port or third port some people get off in the fourth port like that it goes on but that is luxury one then there are others who need to travel because there is no other mode of transportation available or affordable then the ship is cheaper but there are very few ships like that and generally if you find them today they are generally smaller types all they want is reasonable cleanliness facilities basically kuch khane peene ko milega saste mein theek hai they are happy with it yeah yeah you can rejoin anybody can rejoin no problem so they want reasonable facilities not too much or something but they want it with the budgets then you have got short distance ones voyages less than 24 hours and they may be carrying their own vehicles so they become like a roro passenger ships where they have got a ramp where the uh, you have vehicles of the passengers maybe some as cargo also and then <clears throat> you make the voyage generally these voyages are short voyages part if you are facing internet issue keep on trying okay i can't help you with the internet issue but keep on trying okay anybody who is having this problem because i am recording it later on you can you'll find it on youtube so those ones very often they don't have the sleeping facilities there this short distance ones they may have just sitting facilities not necessarily sleeping one or maybe some you know there are different classes of travel based on who gets a luxury seats and who gets normal seats so you have got luxury passenger ships they are just hotels now always remember what i have told you you make ship for a purpose so you make your purpose first whatever you want and then build ship around it so that you have got what you want which you have made into a floating thing so this is how it is <clears throat> there are a lot of fancy ships you will have on youtube and all but they are like hotels you don't even feel you are on a ship these are the typical ones pnd and some companies are famous for their ships luxury ones and i don't think they will ever go out of fashion they will always be available for people to relax you know there are some ships who go on three day cruises they sail out on friday or thursday evening <clears throat> they go around at the sea only they have casinos everything and then they come back to the same port <coughs> on uh, monday early morning it happened through miami once upon a time i used to see them when i was sailing then you have got ordinary passenger ships they are like budget hotels you know just minimum requirements then they were used for pilgrimage service hajj you know especially from india hajj was there one of the regular ones and we even had a company mogul lines then it was merged with shipping corporation of india the mogul line used to operate this today you may not have many because aircrafts are practically taken over these types of ships but 
you may find them in uh, smaller countries sizes may be smaller so what is a passenger ship this, this cargo is people so we when we ask a question what is the cargo on passenger ship the people they can be luxury liner cruise ships the floating seven star floating hotels means you just take hotel with all the resorts and put it on top that's it and build ship around it disco swimming pool sun decks movie theaters you name it they are there then you have got ordinary passenger liners the very few left today but they are for transportation of people on a certain budget like budget hotels and all that okay within this budget i want to travel you can travel that is where sometimes you know uh, people go on excursion from colleges and all then you have got this type which are like uh, ferries ferries also carry passengers but less than 24 hours normally limited number of cabins are available you can book because somebody who wants to cross he wants to sleep there and so he can afford it so they provide you with the luxury to ordinary seva then like airport railway station like things you know small things you just like a hall for waiting small restaurant like then uh, maybe canteen type of self service restaurant small shop restroom etc things okay there i have shown you two photographs but you will find them like different places have got different ones especially island nations have got them more often than not because the island nations like indonesia philippines uh, korea south korea has got lot of islands okay then japan of course then you go to kiribati and those pacific the island nations there are so then you will find lot more like this more this type rather than this type this is more typical in the port you know one end to other end of the port normally these are the ones you will find in those indonesia and all now what is it they are ferries now ferry passenger ships on you know ferries which carry passengers so they become once you carry more than 12 you are a passenger ship when your passenger ship you have got lot of regulations to follow for safety of passengers that you will come to that in probably fourth semester about you know the special arrangements which are made for passengers then generally they go across in the river ports like for example danube river goes through nine countries and ends up in black sea that's one of the longest starts in germany and goes through nine countries or something and comes to black sea now there if people are traveling they travel across the nations so it's okay they can carry passengers vehicles small animals whatever they want they can then the coastal ferries are basically for inter island travels which are like a smaller format where they don't have a deep draft so that is easy to for them to land the themselves on the berth because you see finally is economics what you need you will build you will not build extra things so everything is clear right now yes or no yes sir okay to flip over anybody any doubts no so let us flip over to the next one passenger ships do not have variations all passengers are same is it true hmm false passenger ships have got lots of variations liquid cargo carriers this is we are heading for the end like you know liquid cargo carriers means your cargo is in form of liquid how do you carry it now solas that you will come across solas it is like a bible for seafarers that solas 
has got a definition. A tanker is a cargo ship. That is for sure. First thing, tanker is a cargo ship. Cargo ship variations, no? Everything is a cargo. Adopted for carriage of bulk of liquid cargoes of an inflammable nature. So, remember when we say tanker, tanker is attached or tagged with inflammable cargoes. Otherwise, it is a liquid carrier. So, if it is hazardous or if it is inflammable cargo, then only it is considered as a tanker because construction rules are different. You can remember this much? Yes, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. Yes, sir. Because, you know, later on this definition can cause all sorts of issues, you know, in uh, thinking, understanding. When we say tanker, it is with inflammable nature. Liquid cargo carriers, we may use words like a tanker. Okay, it happens. That's a mistake. Those are liquid cargo carriers, but you don't want to use the three words. So, you try to say it's okay. Then you have got other types. Pressurized and liquefied gas carriers. They can be tankers. It depends on the gas. Okay. If it is nitrogen, suppose, huh? I don't think you carry nitrogen like this anyway, but if it is inflammable, then it is a tanker, if otherwise it is a gas carrier. Gases are actually pressurized and cooled, you know, they are at like minus 150 degrees Celsius and all, those types of temperatures. So, those are gas carriers. Then you have got general liquid carriers. Those are like orange juice, edible oil, some chemicals, some wines. Depends. All of them are double hull ships. All of them. Okay, this much clear? Yes, no? Yes, sir. Liquid yes, sir. cargo carriers. Yes, Tanker cargoes are not of inflammable nature. It is false. They are always inflammable. Okay. Now, types of tanker ships. Okay. I am going to play a video now. Now, in this picture only you can see in a different sizes. See, this is huge. These are two tiny ones in front of it. Because depending on uh, cargoes and, you know, finally it has to be parcel size. You are not going to run a big bus service with, uh, say, 60 passengers when you get only 4 passengers. Then you are going to run a mini bus, right? Something like that you have to think. So, I will play this video now. The transportation of bulk liquids began in the late 19th century when the discovery and expedition of oils began in the late 19th century when the discovery and expedition of oils began. At that time, tankers emerged as the main mode of transportation to carry bulk liquids from refineries to the global market. As time passed, different energy products were produced and need of various types of tankers came into the real picture. Presently, a variety of products such as crude oil, finished petroleum products, liquefied natural gas, chemicals, edible oils, wine, juice, molasses, etc are transported through tankers. Tankers play a major share of more than 33% of the world fleet tonnage. Tankers, however, are not restricted to one particular type or variety. There are many types of tankers in terms of use, construction and size. There are two main categories by which shipping tankers can be classified by type purpose and by size. 
Let's take a look at classification of tankers on basis of types. Oil tankers. Oil tankers, as their name suggests, carry oil and its byproducts. An oil tanker is designed to carry wide variety of petroleum products in bulk ranging from crude oil to refined products. Their size is measured in dead weight tonnage and ranges from 55,000 dead weight tonnage to VLCCs of over 300,000 dead weight tonnage. Due to their immense size, they have become quite cheaper to transport petroleum products. It costs around 2 to 4 cents per gallon only. Oil tankers are further subdivided into two main types, product tankers and crude tankers. Product tankers are used to transport petroleum-based chemicals. They are used to carry refined oil of various grades and are smaller in size as compared to the crude oil tankers. Crude tankers These vessels are much larger in size than the other variants of oil tankers and move a large quantity of unrefined crude oil to the oil refineries. Gas tankers They are specially designed to carry different forms of gases. As per the type of cargo carried and the requirements, these tankers can be classified into five categories. Fully pressurized ships. In these type of tankers, the cargo is carried in the ambient temperature. They have C type of tanks which are made of carbon steel. There are no thermal insulations or any other plants. The cargo can be directly transferred by the pumps or compressor of the ship. Semi-pressurized ships. These are very similar to fully pressurized ships in terms of the tank construction and structure. But they are designed to carry gas at a maximum working pressure of 5 to 7 bars. These ships can be used to transport a wide variety of gas cargo in bulk. Due to its cargo handling flexibility, semi-pressurized gas tankers are most popular among the operators and owners. Ethylene ships. This variant of gas carriers are built for unambiguous trades which also have arrangements to carry LPG or chemical gases. Their cargo carrying capacity is between 1000 to 12000 cubic meter. Fully refrigerated LPG ships. These types of ships can carry liquefied gases at low temperature and atmospheric pressure. They have prismatic shaped cargo tanks made up of 3.5% nickel steel which allow them to carry cargo at a temperature as low as minus 48 degrees centigrade. LNG carrier Statistically speaking, there are around 500 LNG tankers that are currently under operation. LNG is now considered to be the alternative fuel for ships to comply with IMO 2020. LNG carriers are specifically designed to trade high volume of LNG. These ships have a cargo carrying capacity of 125,000 to 135,000 cubic meter. LNG is carried at its boiling point, which is minus 162 degrees centigrade, inside a specialized membrane tank. Chemical tankers. They range from 5,000 to 35,000 dead weight tonnage in size. The size of these vessels is smaller as compared to the oil tankers due to the specialized nature of the cargo and the size restriction of the ports and shore facilities. They consist of various tanks which are coated with specialized coatings such as phenolic epoxy, stainless steel or zinc paint. Slurry tankers Slurry refers to all those materials that do not disperse or dissolve in water 
and are otherwise regarded as waste material. These type of vessels are not ideal for shipping any chemical products other than slurry itself. Hydrogen tankers. These tankers are specifically designed to carry liquefied hydrogen gas in bulk. Kawasaki Heavy Industries was the first company to design a hydrogen tanker. Juice tankers, as the name suggests, these tankers are specially designed for the carriage of juice. They either carry concentrated or fresh orange juice originating from Brazil to other parts of the world. These tankers have refrigeration, temperature controller and preservation plants which helps them to keep the juice fresh at all times. Wine tankers Transporting wine has become quite simpler as sleek wine tankers are used specifically to carry wine. These tankers are used in carrying wine from the place of production to different countries. Integrated Tuck Barge ITBs are prominently used in the eastern coast of the United States. These tankers are mainly tugs attached to barge leading to the formation of a single cargo carrying unit. Let's take a look at the type of tankers on the basis of size. Very large crude carriers, PLCC tankers have a cargo carrying capacity of 250,000 tons. Ultra large crude carriers, ULCC are mega ships that have a cargo hauling capacity which ranges up to 500,000 tons. Panamax and New Panamax, the type of tanker that can pass through the Panama Canal is known as Panamax. New Panamax vessels are those which can cross the recently made New Panama Canal and have an average capacity of 65,000 deadweight tonnage. The cargo tankers which cannot be classified under Panamax category because of their bigger size are known as the post Panamax tankers. Aframax The Aframax cargo tankers are the type of tanker ships which are mainly used in the Mediterranean Sea, China Sea and the Black Sea. These tankers have a dead weight tonnage between 80,000 and 120,000 tons. Suez Max Panamax tankers are named for vessels which can navigate through the Panama Canal. Similarly, Suez Max vessels are so called because they can pass through the Suez Canal. Qmax these are the largest LNG carriers that can dock at the LNG terminals in Qatar, having length of approximately 345 meters and capacity of 266,000 cubic meters. It cannot be denied that in the present day scenario, the whole world runs in oil and gas and tanker shipping offers the best possible transportation efficiency of these products. If you have any questions or suggestions, please drop your comments below and we will get back to you at the earliest. If you like this video, please subscribe to Marine Insight channel and press the bell icon to get notified when we post such amazing videos. Please like, comment and share this video and do not forget to subscribe. Okay. Did you get some idea? Yes, no? Yes, sir. Okay. This is see, this is basically the chapter is about more of a general knowledge about the ships rather than, you know, getting in a deep on any type of ship. Once you understand, yes, this is the variety you have got. So, the later on, as you start getting more and more things in syllabus, you will be more comfortable. That is the reason this is the first chapter, types of ships. Okay. Okay or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Do tankers vary a lot due to nature of cargo? What will be? Yes or no?
Hmm. Very true. Very good. Now we come to the classification little more deeply. Okay. Everybody is awake. Yes, no. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Yes, you are awake, no? Yes, sir. Where things can become boring at times, you know. Okay, these crude oil chips are like up to five lakh tons, and they're designed to carry only the crude oil. Okay, so they have got when you say crude oil ships, means they will have a crude oil washing system. Cow, it is called cow. Crude oil washing system, cow. And they will also have inert gas. Both the things will be there always. Huge, the huge, like a sleeping giants. You know, when they go, when you are on ship, no, you just see you moving smoothly, like a huge elephant is going through. They have got tanks. They are all double hull ships, double hull, and. There are tanks and pumps. Pumps have got pump room. Okay, now this is another one. We will start this. Why it did not go through YouTube actually last time? Let's see. This link is not working, obviously. They are the largest moving objects ever built. Their fleet carries over 100 million tons of oil in a single day. Targets in wars and targeted by environmentalists, they are an essential lifeline to industrialized nations around the globe. Now, oil tankers on Modern Marvels. Longer than most skyscrapers are tall, they are steel giants carrying Earth's most valuable commodity. Oil tankers transport over half of the nearly 80 million barrels of oil the world consumes on a daily basis. In an oil-dependent world, no nation consumes more than the United States. But America only produces about one-third of its needed supply. The rest must be imported from thousands of miles away. Regretfully, oil is found in some locations that are a great distance from, from markets such as the United States and, and in Europe. And the only way to move that is either by ship or by pipeline. Oil tankers come in a range of sizes and are classified by their DWT, or dead weight tonnage, which is a tanker's weight when fully loaded. The five dominant classes are named Panamax, Aframax, Suez Max, very large crude carriers or BLCCs, and ultra large crude carriers or ULCCs. The latter two are more commonly referred to as super tankers. In some cases, a tanker's classification name also specifies the region in which it can safely operate when fully loaded. For example, a Panamax is the largest tanker that can pass through the Panama Canal. A Suez Max is the maximum size tanker that is permitted to transit the Suez Canal. Larger tankers, such as super tankers, have drafts that are too deep and must use alternative waterways. Although oil tankers come in a variety of sizes, they're all built for one singular purpose, to carry oil. Lots and lots of oil. And this lone intent is reflected in the tanker's design. Beneath the steel skin of an oil tanker are a series of tanks subdivided by bulkheads. In a large size tanker, tanks are generally divided into three compartments that extend the width of the hull. 
and as many as 40 compartments that extend the length of the hull. The reason for doing that is to prevent the cargo sloshing and to provide stability. I think often the easy way of explaining it is if you were to carry a large bowl of, of water, I think one becomes very conscious of the fact that it's difficult to maintain the stability. If you can subdivide it by putting in divisions, um, it makes it a much more stable cargo. Aft of the cargo tanks, at the stern of the ship, is a lone tower known as the superstructure which houses all the necessary control rooms and crew accommodations. The remainder of a tanker's deck is an array of pipes used to transport oil, either into or out of the tank compartments below. As soon as an oil tanker leaves port, it becomes an entirely self-sufficient floating city, capable of producing all of its own electricity. They have huge generating units uh, and generating electricity to, to not only keep the cargo uh, contained and heated, but also to heat the ship and to run the equipment. They're very large power plants uh, moving across the ocean. And the larger the tanker, the more easily it can slip through the water. Therefore, a VLCC requires only a single 30,000 horsepower diesel engine for power. The propulsion system consists of a single propeller and rudder, capable of moving a fully loaded VLCC at a speed of 15 knots. Auxiliary generators produce the ship's electricity. Tankers, uh, by nature, are the most energy efficient of all vehicles uh, in terms of energy per ton mile of the goods transported. We're moving at a cost of about two cents per gallon. So at the gas pump, the, the actual price we're paying for gasoline has about two cents for having transported the oil. At a port in the Pacific Northwest, the Suez Max tanker British Harrier is in the process of offloading cargo to its Cherry Point refinery. The crude we're carrying is from Argentina, and it's called Escalante. We carry one million barrels. Um, it's that equivalent to probably 35 million gallons or so. It's a lot of oil. Although the Harrier looks safe in the calm waters of the port, offloading is actually one of the most dangerous aspects of its journey. Certainly, this is the risky part. We change the condition of the vessel greatly. This is a dynamic process, and it requires careful monitoring to avoid uh, incidents, accidents bad things, really. During cargo discharge, combustible gases are present on the deck of the ship. A single spark can lead to a catastrophic explosion. Crude oil is offloaded by huge steel pipes that extend the length of a tanker's center compartments. Additional pipes branch out from the main pipes in order to reach cargo in the starboard and port tanks. When the vessel is ready to discharge, hydraulic pumps create a vacuum inside the steel pipes, sending the cargo to more pipes that run along the ship's deck. From there, the oil is sent to a refinery or storage container via additional conduits. The discharging process for the Harrier will take 30 hours to complete. We'll have to run our pumps carefully to get as much out as possible. And I can assure you this vessel is going to be dry as popcorn at the end of the operation. But even after its combustible cargo has been emptied, the Harrier can still be a dangerous place. The power of the sea is so great, you've really got to watch the weather because if you're doing full speed and the weather does deteriorate, the combined force of the weather hitting the ship can do a lot of damage. It can take steel structures on deck just away. To avoid accidents, sophisticated navigation tools are essential. On this ship, you can actually program the ship to work the course itself. The navigation with GPS, and that's accurate up to 50 meters. Um, so yeah, you just read off uh, a dial and there you are. Besides the weather and combustible cargo, the crew of the Harrier must battle one more hazard of sea life, boredom. It can be boring, 
uh, especially old tankers there at sea for long periods. They load offshore, they don't go into port as often as container ships or boat carriers, and they can tend to be boring. The trip from Argentina to the west coast takes the British Harrier 21 days. To help pass the time, the Harrier is equipped with a gym, a recreation room, a bar, a full kitchen with chefs, a dining facility, and a complete complement of musical instruments. If you're going to have a love at the sea, you need an attitude, a certain attitude to do this job. You got to love it. <laughs> you got to love the job to do it, I suppose. The British Harrier exemplifies the efficiency of the modern oil tanker. But achieving this level of efficiency took the industry over a hundred years and two world wars. With a deadweight tonnage of more than 564,000, the Yari Viking is the world's largest oil tanker. Measuring 1,504 feet in length, she is over 250 feet longer than the Empire State Building is tall. Oil tankers will return on Modern Marvels. Today's global tanker fleet provides an essential lifeline to the industrialized nations of the world. But transferring oil by ship isn't new. Its history dates back thousands of years, when the Greeks, Romans, and Phoenicians transported oil across the Mediterranean Sea. No, not petroleum oil, olive oil. Like petroleum oil, olive oil was the most important commodity of its day. And it commonly served as the financial backbone for an exporting nation's economy. Wood ships fitted with multiple sails were built to reach trading posts throughout the Mediterranean. Instead of transporting the oil inside the hull of the ship, the cargo was stored in baked clay amphorae. During the Middle Ages, ship trading expanded as it became cheaper and safer to traverse the world's oceans and seas. In the centuries that followed, the developments of ocean-going warships and efficient merchant carriers also led to a rapid expansion of commerce. But it was the 1859 discovery of oil by Edwin Drake in Titusville, Pennsylvania that would bring overseas shipping to new levels of prosperity. Two years after striking black gold, three million barrels of oil were being pumped each year in Titusville, with the majority of it being refined into kerosene. Coined the new illuminant, kerosene created a demand that stretched across the Atlantic to an oil-thirsty European continent. In November of 1861, the Elizabeth Watts made the first transatlantic shipment of oil from Philadelphia to London. Storing the cargo in wooden barrels, the double-masted 224-ton wood ship carried 1,329 barrels of oil on her maiden voyage. And those barrels had value, so having reached their destination, they were emptied and were then shipped back empty. So at the time, it was considered an efficient system, but shipping back empty barrels was not efficient. The barrels which each held 42 U.S. gallons, accounted for up to a fifth of the ship's actual cargo weight. In 1886, British shipbuilders improved on the inefficient barrel with what most consider to be the world's first modern oil tanker, the iron and steel constructed Glukov. That ship utilized the hull of the vessel as the containment system. It was able to carry a larger cargo, steam powered, wasn't so dependent on the weather, and it meant that one could actually um, organize the transportation on a more regular basis. The Glukov could travel at a rate of nine knots, holding 3,020 tons of oil in eight storage tanks that were subdivided by a series of vertical and horizontal bulkheads. Oil was pumped into the cargo tanks from shore and was protected from leakage by boiler riveted steel plating that also formed the outer wall of the tanks. To further maximize the amount of oil that she could carry, the ship's cumbersome engine was moved from middle to far aft. The bridge tower and officers' quarters were relocated to the middle, and the smokestack and crew's quarters placed at the stern. 
The bow of the ship was home to a raised forecastle that protected her against rough seas and provided storage for supplies. The Vukov's distinct three island structure became the standard for tanker design for more than 60 years. In the early 1900s, the world's deep sea tanker fleet numbered 145 ships. With trading between the United States and Europe, reaching 2.3 million tons of crude a year. The largest tankers in the fleet had a cargo capacity of 12,000 tons, nearly four times that of the Glukov. But this increase in tanker size began to compromise their seaworthiness. Sir Joseph Isherwood came up with a solution in 1906. When the ship's going through the waves, it's moving um, up and down and bending in a longitudinal way. And the Isherwood system was developed to provide some longitudinal rigidity to help uh, the vessel in terms of its bending. Before the Isherwood design, ships were built using numerous transverse frames, which formed the ribs of the ship. In Isherwood's design, the ship's frames ran fore and aft, along the length of the ship, parallel to the keel. The frames were then connected to the keel by vertical bulkheads, which also divided the tanks. By 1914, 276 ships had incorporated the Isherwood design. The Isherwood system has been refined and modified, but it is still the underlying system that is employed in the construction of ships. The design system for the modern oil tanker had been achieved. But the onset of the First World War would bring about a new breed of tanker for the military, called an oiler, and a new method of transferring oil, known as underway replenishment. The tanker is a ship that's able to carry petroleum or water or some other liquid substance from point A to point B. An oiler can do that, but it also can do what the Navy calls underway replenishment, whereby it can refuel other ships while sailing across the ocean. In World War I, the strategy of the German Navy focused on Britain's dependence on oil imports to fuel its war campaign. Germany's new weapon, the U-boat, set up a blockade in the North Atlantic to cut off Britain's oil supply. When the U.S. entered the war in 1917, the Royal Navy was limited to a 10-week supply of oil. With little time to spare, the U.S. Navy sent a fleet of destroyers to assist the embattled British fleet. These destroyers had a very limited range. They could just barely make it across the Atlantic. To ensure that they wouldn't have any problems, the Navy arranged to have them be refueled in mid-ocean by one of the Navy's oilers. Before the U.S. joined the war, Chester Nimitz and the officers aboard the Navy tanker Maumee designed a ship-to-ship -ship refueling system that consisted of two 50-foot-long rubber hoses suspended by cargo booms. The Maumee was the first ship to perform underway replenishment. The advantage of underway replenishment is that the fleet or Navy formation can keep steaming while it is refueling as versus having to go to a port somewhere and spend the time to refuel and then proceed on to its destination. By July 5th, 1917, the Maumee had refueled 34 destroyers headed for Europe. They helped break the German U-boat blockade. The significance of refueling these destroyers was it was the first time that anyone had refueled ships at sea in a tactical operation. And it was the forerunner of uh, something that would happen again and again, especially in World War II. In the mid-1930s, war clouds began to form again on the global landscape. The United States military was quick to realize that if a second world war were to erupt, it would be a fully mechanized conflict, and tremendous amounts of oil would be needed to ensure victory. The Navy laid out a very detailed structural plan on how the Navy was going to get from the west coast of the United States to the Far East to be able to engage its main enemy, which it felt was Japan. So it knew in the interwar years that refueling at sea would become a critical element of this. The Navy needed a fleet oiler in a hurry and looked towards the commercial tanker industry for assistance. 
In 1939, the Navy purchased the 553-foot tanker, Cimarron, from the Standard Oil Company. She was a very unusual ship. She was fairly large, but more importantly, she had twin screws. It's a very fast ship with a bulbous bow. They allowed the ship to have a speed of 18 knots at a time when 14 or 15 knots was the norm for a fast commercial tanker. And this speed was very important because this would allow the ship to steam with the fleet. The Cimarron became the prototype fleet oiler for the Navy. When the U.S. entered the war after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Cimarron class quickly distinguished itself in the battle for the Pacific. The real significance of the Cimarron class was that it permitted the United States to conduct the famous carrier raids that we're all familiar with. It's a little known fact that every one of those raids was accompanied by an oiler. And this was because the destroyers all had to be refueled at sea because they had limited range vessels. In addition to refueling at sea, the U.S. military needed to transfer millions of gallons of oil to the thousands of tanks, trucks, and planes it would be needed in Europe and along the Pacific fronts. Tankers were always a prime target of U-boats because they're important ships. Their cargo is important. So whenever a submarine saw a tanker, it would always go after it. The Allied forces were faced with the challenge of building tankers faster than the Axis powers could sink them. Their answer was the T-2 tanker. It was a standard design which allowed the ships to be built very quickly. They actually would construct segments on shore and then bring them to the building yard. And each time they built a tanker, they learned how to build it faster or quicker. About 525 of them were built throughout the war. They could do about 15 knots. They could carry all forms of petroleum. They were very instrumental in being able to support our forces overseas with large amounts of petroleum products. By the end of the war, the Navy's oilers and tankers have provided an invaluable lifeline of fuel to the Allied forces. While the oil tanker of World War II had achieved new levels of performance and size, a booming post-war economy was about to give rise to the oil tanker tycoon and the dawn of the super tanker. During the invasion of Okinawa in World War II, oilers delivered over 10 million barrels of fuel oil to the fleet at sea by underway replenishment. Oil tankers will return on Modern Marvels. The end of World War II marked the beginning of unprecedented growth for the United States economy. Post-war Americans wanted to drive fast and travel far. By the early 1950s, American imports of petroleum, petroleum products exceeded exports for the first time. Oil companies and ambitious entrepreneurs were eager to feed America's high demand for oil and took advantage of a unique opportunity. After the Second World War, the U.S. government has over 600 tankers of all sorts. The American oil companies put pressure upon the U.S. government to sell off these surplus T2 tankers. So for about four years, the United States sells over 400 of these 600 tankers to American and foreign oil companies. Many of the T2 tankers were retrofitted by their new owners so that they could carry more cargo. Okay, I'm stopping here, okay, because it will go on and you must be already bored. It's already 8.45. So is it okay to stop here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Anyway, see, this is from YouTube. You watch remaining one on YouTube, okay, when you get time. Okay, sir. Basic idea is to understand how the things developed. You know, means uh, it is not something that shipping it just evolved like that. It has gone through variety of things, experiences. We are towards uh, some uh, thing. 
later on you will find even these things changing you know as what is today after 40 years you will say that was too old so we all go through the same experience so now uh, are you understanding everything or no that's the first question yes sir how many of you say yes sir Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Means I assume everybody is understanding or I should ask who doesn't understand. Then nobody comes forward actually. That is the problem. Okay. So, when we go through all these types of ships, we'll finish it probably uh, today, tomorrow. This week definitely we'll finish types of ships. And we'll move on to the next chapter, which will be much easier because this one was designed to try out a lesson pattern. So that is where I'm getting like, you know, stuck like this YouTube should have gone actually on a YouTube, this link. It didn't go. Otherwise, uh, you know, I can control it better there than here. But anyway, you complete this on YouTube. That is the homework. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and finish the knowledge check here. Crude oil carriers have crude oil washing system, but no inert gas system. It is false. They have crude oil washing system. Means what they do is they clean their tanks first with the cargo only crude oil. And to do that, to avoid the fire, they need inert gas system. So both the things are there. Not only half. But no inert gas is wrong. Okay, we will stop here. Petroleum product 